This is the American Law Journal. Sometimes it's at the center of a great custody battle. Doc wants kid on a drug. Mom says yes, dad says no. What's a court to do? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton, and tonight, drugs, alcohol, medication, and the custody battle. And we're not just talking about legal drugs here, and we're not just talking about junior. We're talking about what if parents have a problem with a legal or an illegal drug? How does that impact the custody process? Three guests tonight, two lawyers and a psychologist. Let's go ahead and meet them. Bonnie Frost hails from Einhorn Harris. Asher Barbarito and Frost in New Jersey, and uh, she and many other of her partners have taken family law cases to the Supreme Court in the state of New Jersey. Dr. Ronald Esteve joins us tonight for the very first time, a clinical and counseling psychologist. He specializes in family and parental therapy and is often called upon as an expert witness in custody matters. And if we're talking family law, chances are Don Spry will be on the set uh, sharing his uh, three plus decades of family law experience, two of those decades uh, right here on our set at the American Law Journal. We're going to start with the so-called legal medication at the top of the show. We'll get to alcohol and some of the illegal drugs like cocaine and marijuana, etc. But here's a very interesting statistic. Twice as many families who have a child diagnosed with ADHD are likely to suffer through a divorce. Children of divorce are far more likely to be prescribed ADHD or SSRI drugs. And children who are members of a family going through a divorce are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with depression. Doc, this probably doesn't surprise you at all. You probably see this every day. That's correct. It's not just divorce, it's parental conflict. Um, that is one of the, if not the most damaging event in a child's life, uh, accepting uh, trauma. Um, and if the parents are in chronic conflict, um, it's natural for children to be frightened. It's a threat to their most basic need, which is to feel safe and secure and accepted and loved. Um, and that they might have an affective response, which might uh, uh, present itself or manis manifest itself as either depression or anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, or acting out. All are perfectly typical, normal, predictable. And for better or for worse, we're far past the, the age or the era where just talk therapy would be utilized even with a, with a child. Nowadays, uh, you know, drugs and medication plays a much larger role and, and again uh, you know depending on uh, who's looking at the case that can be a life-saving situation it could also be highly problematic I imagine it must come up in custody battles maybe frequently what do you think doc yes it does come up frequently um, y you need to remember that unlike uh, an adult who comes into therapy they've chosen to come into therapy but when a child is identified for treatment by one or both of the parents it's because somebody, typically one of the parents, has experienced some kind of disruption um, which they've associated with uh, pathology, which may or may not be accurate. Um, or they may simply be misinformed based on uh, lack of information. Mm -hmm. Or it may represent conflict between the two of them. They see their child struggling in some fashion and they may want to blame the other parent. You saw some of the statistics I ran up there just a moment ago. How often do you see it in your practice, Don, Bonnie? Does ADHD, does Ritalin, do these kinds of issues come up very often, rarely? How, how often, Bonnie? I don't think they come up frequently, but they do come up. It's not an uncommon issue to have to address. Mm -hmm. And Don, it's usually one says yes, the other says no. Now, all of a sudden, where are we? Well, if they can't resolve it, um then a judge is going to have to make the call. And um, it, it poses problems if, if you have, for example, Asperger's or some that uh, Dr. Estive could refer to, um, that any change can be problematic. So it might be a problem for a, a, a weekday or a midweek visitation or a partial custody. Um, it, it just has unique issues. Uh, and because we have in Pennsylvania uh, the concept of joint legal custody where both parents have to uh, have input into major right. decisions, mm -hmm. if they can't agree with the help of a therapist or some other professional, then it's going to be in front of a judge. And Well, does this usually come with the custody battle or, is, or is it, do you find that sometimes this is what has actually spurred or has triggered mm -hmm. the custody battle? I've seen it also in post-judgment. It happens, you know, as children mature, sometimes the problems become exacerbated with 
becoming in puberty and all of a sudden the, the problem emerges and I think that judges and I could be wrong on this certainly but I think judges are predisposed to the medical model right. so they're going to be more disposed to adopting uh, someone's professional opinion this medication is going to solve the problem versus the, taking the other person's side, right. saying, no, maybe we shouldn't medicate. Is it usually psychiatrists or psychologists that get called upon? Because I would think psychiatrists, you know, those are the doctors that prescribe drugs. I've had it with psychiatrists because right. they're the ones that prescribe. Are they, are they more quick to prescribe drugs? I, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. Doc, how about yourself? Again, you're a psychologist. I, again, part of your practice is not to prescribe drugs, but let's face it, in, in, in an era of, again, ADHD or uh, depression matters. I mean, quite often that's part of the arsenal that medical science, or at least doctors, are going to use. How do you get involved in that if you're a psychologist? Uh, <clears throat> most all research demonstrates that uh, the efficacy of any medication, be it for depression or anxiety or for specifically uh, ADHD, mm -hmm. is not going to be nearly as effective if it's not included with both education and counseling. Mm -hmm. um, and if you ignore that, uh, in essence, you haven't changed the environment, um, and so the same problems are going to continue to manifest themselves. So medication of itself is never going to be an answer. Right. And that, it sounds like that's what you recommend uh, on a 100% basis. That's correct. Right. Yes. Now, of course, one of the big problems has got to be that you, you talk about joint legal custody, and that means that Betty is living with mom and, and may always be living with mom, but that the dad has input. And again, something such as medication for depression or for ADHD is, is a big decision. But Betty's still living with mom. Let's take a look at this email because I think it's illustrative of what must go on quite a bit. I have joint legal custody of my kids. The custody agreement says medical decisions must be a shared decision. My ex-wife was not happy with grades of my 13-year-old. She got mostly B's and C's and took my daughter to a doctor. The doctor prescribed ADHD medication. I'm very much against the medication. I do not want my daughter to take the medication. Mother is giving it to daughter anyway. I think that that's a classic circumstance where a decision is going to have to be made for consistency. In other words, a judge is going to have to, if the, if the parents can't work this out, then a judge is going to have to make a decision so that that child gets consistent medication as opposed to four days on, four days off. Uh, I mean, there has to be a, a protocol or a regimen. And Doc, some of these medications, if you do stop and start, with them, it can be very deleterious to a kid. Absolutely. No? Um, and you mentioned an antidepressant medication. Really, the, in terms of SSRIs, the only medication that would typically be used for uh, an adolescent would be Prozac. Um, that's the only one that's approved, really. And even right. then, that should be used very rarely. Right. As for the ADHD uh, medications, if you, unless you're doing this in a specific way that you're providing, in essence, what's called a vacation from the medication, so it's prescribed, um, say, over the summer or some such thing. Um, but if you're introducing it, then pulling it back, introducing it and pulling it back, you're, in essence, confusing the child that much further. How does a psychologist like a Dr. Rona Steve get involved in the mix? In other words, is it the court that orders it? Is it something that the parties agree upon? Do you see it both ways? Is it where one party is kicking and screaming, saying, no, I don't want my kid on this medication. I don't even want the kid to be evaluated? I try to get the parents to agree to go to a professional. Okay. Um, but it doesn't always work. So if it doesn't work, then I would file a, uh, a, pr a, pr a proceeding with the court and get it before the court to get a decision made as to um, whether they're going to go to a therapist and uh, who that therapist will be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the only alternative. Who makes that choice, Bonnie? Well, it ended up being the judge. And more often than not, we would do the same thing in New Jersey. We'd have to file a motion and the, and the court always says, I'm not the expert in this. Right. Even though you want me to make the decision, I'm really not the expert in that, this, and that's why they call upon a psychiatrist or psychologist to, to do an evaluation to assist the court in making the right decision for the child. And if they think their one parent is keeping the medication away, that person may not have the joint physical custody anymore. Right. It may end up being a whole entirely different parenting plan in order to keep the medication consistent with the child. I would think that time is your enemy here, though. 
because let's face it, the, the, the legal process doesn't work that quickly. Even if there's an emergent matter, how fast can you get in front of a master or a judge? If, in New uh, Jersey, 24 yeah. hours, 48 hours. Can you really get in yes. that? You really could. So in other words, let's say one of your clients said, hey, my wife stopped giving my kid an, an, an antidepressant. And whether she agrees or not, if she pulls them off of this, I know there's going to be ramifications. Bonnie Frost, what do I do? So what do you do? Spring into action. What do you do? Well, one of two things. We could do a motion, depending on the other facts. If he had a report from a doctor, if he had reports from the superintendent of schools, the, school, mm -hmm. the child's teachers, saying this is really an extreme situation or the kid's running away from home, any types of those extraordinary facts, then we could get into court on what we call an order to show cause within 24 to 48 hours, as long wow. as you could okay. gather all the appropriate right. paperwork for filing. But right. um, if you didn't have those types of extraordinary facts, then you'd have to file a motion, right. which okay. would be a 28 day turnaround, which gotcha. is somewhat different than Pennsylvania, I right. think. Tell us, Don. Well, if it's emergent relief here, uh, it's the same thing that uh, Bonnie said. I you talk to the professionals, if they convince me uh, that I can convince a judge that this has to be dealt with quickly, then we can get in within, you know, very quickly. Um, otherwise, um, if it runs its course, um, just a regular filing, mm -hmm. it may take um, 30 days to get in front of a master, you know. Okay. Um, but you can get, you, the courts are accessible if, quickly if you have the facts to get you there. Mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Steve, do you find that you're getting calls not just from attorneys to, to work with some of their clients, but it's, it's actually the court that picks up the phone and calls you and says, we have an emergent matter, we have an important matter here, we'd like to bring you in as an expert. Yes, yes, absolutely. Of course, you're talking about two different things. One is treatment and the other is, is doing the evaluation and you're sort of going back and forth between both of them. Mm -hmm. The evaluation doesn't typically happen as quickly, but yes, the court certainly does that. Treatment is, is more difficult when it's court ordered because then there's a really difficult task of, of convincing the people involved that you're trying to help them, um, that you're not trying to take sides, but you're trying to help them make a decision. And, and Bonnie pointed out uh, quite correctly a, a moment ago that it, the more professionals you have expressing independent of each other the same or similar opinion, the greater the likelihood that that opinion is correct. Technically, or really legally a, an expert witness is a witness you know a judge is free to accept or reject whatever an expert witness says I think in a in a case where you're talking about ADHD or these sorts of medications you, you'd have experts in all those cases mm -hmm. the new Pennsylvania custody laws that uh, have just come down in the last year has triggered this area of practice and I would have to think uh, Although the doctor can't comment on this, I would have to think, Don, that there's going to be a lot more work for psychologists in this area because the new custody laws in PA demand evaluation at different junctures and almost every step where is in the past, it wasn't as pervasive. It wasn't as all-inclusive. Tell us a little bit about these custody laws and why evaluation now is going to play such a big part. Well, there's a, there's a section of the new law which came into a... Um effect in January 2011 that provides that if you were convicted or pled guilty um, to um, certain crimes, um, one being a driving under the influence, one being a violation of the, uh, um, the drug law, uh, one being imbibing alcohol, um, no matter when that crime occurred, doesn't matter how long ago, uh, the court has to make an evaluation to determine whether or not the person or the member of the household could be a problem for the child. And if the court determines that uh, the child could be at risk as a result of that crime, then an evaluator has to be appointed who specializes in that sort of uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Drug and alcohol, um, th th those kind of things. So I don't know how much Dr. Estive has seen of this yet, but it's, it's out there. And, and if the court determines uh, that an evaluation has to occur, then the, the visitation, the partial custody doesn't happen until there's the, somebody says to a judge and the judge accepts the fact that the child's not going to be at risk. Uh, Doc, what about that? No, I haven't really seen that much change. Um, most of the evaluations that have come to me from the court are very similar to what they were uh, just a, a year, two, three, or four years ago. And they're really very comprehensive. They cover all areas, including, of course, what Don is referring to. Is it ever an issue when a parent is taking an antidepressant or taking an ADD drug. Does that ever come into play when we're talking about custody? Why a parent should or should not get custody of this child? 
I, I have had that uh, come up, and it always seemed a, l a little bit unfair to me. If somebody is, is addressing, they've identified, and they're addressing a problem, and they're, they're doing it in a prescribed and uh, professional and clear fashion, um, that that would be viewed as a weakness is, is mm -hmm. in and of itself unfortunate. That's, the, the, it's no more a weakness than uh, dealing with any other uh, 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 in, indication. If you had diabetes, for example, um, certainly you would be expected to uh, pursue proper treatment, and you wouldn't be criticized mm -hmm. for that. Um, so that if somebody's identified that they have an affective disorder and they're addressing that and medication right. is part of that, mm -hmm. that's actually a very healthy response and it shouldn't be right. a criticism. No, but it's used by the so-called attacking party sometimes that my wife's depressed, she can't possibly well, handle these things. of course, kids. and sometimes that person's right. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes the medication's not working, sometimes um, the facts are that the medication is not enough or the right kind or but here come the evaluations change. again right so you, right. Get, you get a doctor Mona Steve who might be involved in something like this so, so if someone makes an allegation right. somebody triggers it and says my wife can't handle it and, and you might say maybe that's your client Don say well she's taking care of it, she's maintaining it but now once again the court might order an evaluation because you've got a lot riding on the line here where are the kids going to live who's going to make the determination of how they're going to live their lives that's true I, I mean I, I think what dr. Esty was saying is if there is a problem and it's being dealt with um, and that you can show that it's not adversely affecting the children that that's important furthermore like a um, you know a, I think a judge would look at a DUI mm -hmm. 15 years ago that was real close to the line mm -hmm. and, and evaluate that and say, I don't think that that's going to have an adverse effect on the kids. It happened one time, happened 15 years ago, this person's been clean since then. It's a lot different than somebody who has uh, you know, uh, illegal drugs, was convicted of that a year ago, uh, maybe for the third time. I mean, there, there's all sorts of variants and all of that has to be um, once the evaluation occurs, what they really are looking at is how that um, conduct or problem that the parent has is affecting the child. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that speaks to what Don's saying is that facts are everything. So ha what are the facts? Is this person over, you know, overdosing on his medication? He's not awake. He mm -hmm. can't take care of the child. Right. <clears throat> what's going on doesn't show up doesn't pick the kid up from school right. mm -hmm. forgets the kid I right. mean those those other types of Fact facts right. um, that come out you know can precipitate an evaluation of any rather time. than the allegation someone's on a certain type of drug or, exactly. or someone's depressed or that sort of thing doc what happens if in the middle of a dispute someone fails a drug test uh, they're going to have a problem. <laughs> but is he usually the death knell at that point? I guess. Again, no, no, I know no, it's, no, it's not necessarily. Right. Um, it, it, like everything else, it depends on the circumstance. Right. Um, and depends on how they failed the test and what test spe uh, specifically did they fail right. um, and how honest they were. What if someone has, has had alcohol problems and, and now all of a sudden, you know, uh, they fall off the wagon? Again, alcohol is legal. Uh, this is an issue that, and, and again, I, I know it's all justiciable, it's something that a master could hear or a judge could hear, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, how is it really going to impact the court? How are they going to take this information? And do you see that if someone does fall off the wagon, all of a sudden, that is the defining factor the determining factor of why they've lost custody? Well, I, I don't know that it's the defining factor, but it certainly can be a very significant factor. And regardless of whether it's legal, alcohol, or illegal, uh, cocaine, uh, the fact of the matter is it's abuse. And that's what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's not something which is uh, hampering uh, uh, an individual's functioning. And so that's the focus. Is this person able to behave in a way which is going to be productive? Dr. Steve, what does this process look like? Let's, let's say again that y you've got a party that has, uh, uh, you know, his, his ex or her ex has accused them of aberrant behavior, of, of using illegal drugs. Now the court calls you in. You're going to evaluate both of these parents in all great likelihood if there's an allegation of drug use, uh, correct? Typically, yes. All right. So now you've probably got at least one person there who doesn't want to see you, maybe two. You're working there on behalf of the court. How does this play out? What does it look like? And what do you do so that you can come back to the court later and say, here's my evaluation? Because I've got to think it's pretty bumpy when you're working with people that may be using drugs, A, and B, they don't want to be there. <laughs> 
Um, and, and that's true. Um, and it still goes back to the same thing, which is outlining in, in very, very specific detail from the beginning exactly what I'm going to do and what they can expect from that. Um, and really not wavering from that a whole lot so that they, they know exactly what was going to happen. Um, and that'll include the children too. Unfortunately, sometimes people won't comply. That does happen. And when it does, then I have no alternative. That doesn't become a complete evaluation. And of course, that, that, mm -hmm. that becomes communicated to the court. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, people will, will comply. More often than not, people will follow through. Um, and there really shouldn't be any surprises uh, at the end because of all of the information that's been communicated to them throughout the process. Let me roll this uh, email in. And, and again, I'd like to get some feedback. My husband smokes marijuana on a daily basis. Should he be barred? from being granted custody. I think one question a judge might say, and I've heard judges say this, you know, if you've lived with this person and you've thought it's been okay for this person to smoke pot and take care of your child every day, why is it going to be different now? Interesting. And it so the legal, legality or illegality of marijuana is really not an issue here, per se. No. You know, it really is. a parent. Parent. Right. I mean, they certainly would be interested if they have a, a criminal history and and whatever, because that seems to be on another level. Certainly, right. if they've got, if a person's gotten caught. But you know, when you go, you have to be careful about some of these allegations. I mean, it's sort of like somebody who um, watches porn a lot, mm -hmm. and they'll say, "Well, you know, if you've known that your spouse has been doing this for mm -hmm. ten years and your mm -hmm. kids have been in the house." The only excuse would be, I've protected them, and then when they're on parenting time, you know, with this other spouse, well, I, I'm not there to protect them from that. A judge mm -hmm. still might say, well, you lived with that, and you thought it was okay. So you have yeah. to be aware of some of that when, as a lawyer, you're representing someone who says, this is what's going on. But you see this used as a sword. In fact, probably when you sit down with a client, it's like, he does this. And it's like, okay, I know on the surface that either sounds illegal or may be illegal, but whether it's germane or not to the custody battle. Or whether it's smart, because I think, I agree with Bonnie, I think you have a conversation with your client. I mean, this could go a, a lot of different ways. I mean, yes. a judge may not think it's such a problem if there's no evidence that that's adversely affecting, the, mm -hmm. and, and, and then you, you put the person on the stand who's a professional person, and you ask them whether they're smoking marijuana, and then they run into a professional problem, and they're the one that's making the money to pay support. I mean, it, it, ju it just can get out of hand. It's a matter of public record, no? Yeah. And there's the under problem. Oath, yeah. Right, under oath. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask that, you know, you have to be careful whose ox you're goring here, because it might be your own. Yeah, and, whether, and, and I think as Bonnie said, whether it's worthwhile in the first place. You can mm -hmm. go through all of that, and <clears throat> now you've established that a professional person is breaking the law of smoking marijuana, and the judge says, I don't care. As far I'm in a custody case. Mm -hmm. It's not affecting how he or she is caring for the kids. So right. created a problem you didn't intend to create. <laughs> Doc, what if they bring you in on an issue like that? I'm sure you've been brought in where, you know, someone said my husband smokes marijuana on a daily basis. Now, how do you weigh in on something like that? I think both uh, 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 Don and Bonnie just answered it fine. Um, and it goes to the exact same thing I, I said a moment ago. What's the history? What's the history? And if the, if the history is that this person has been able to function, I'm not going to make a moral judgment, and uh, I don't think anybody else wants to either. If they've been able to function and this has not been a problem, then why is it a problem now? Versus. Is it a problem? Is it something different? Is it impairing somebody's judgment? Is it damaging or potentially causing damage to the child or to themselves? The whole thing about you know therapists not wanting to testify typically because if uh, if you want to um, uh, you know deal with uh, you, you don't want people just posturing for the court. Uh, right, playing to the audience, so yeah. to speak. And and once you once you go into court, you, and you know this, once once you go into court and advocate for somebody, um, well, first of all, you you you, uh, you potentially damage or hurt the relationship you have with the patient. Also, you've you've lost the 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 crux of the relationship, which is confidentiality. Um, you've opened the file, and once you've opened the file. Everybody in, involved in that case has access to that, and they can learn the most intimate information about that individual. And third, if there's a relationship between the therapist and the patient where the therapist is uh, an advocate for the patient, um, it's very dicey to start advocating in the legal system when you shouldn't be.
Um, you can't be uh, independent. That's why the court, if they, if they hire me to do an independent evaluation, that's the point. I don't have a relationship with those people. Right. I don't, I, I've never known them before and I'll never the see APA them again. Too. Yeah, I think it is. Say that again, I, think, I said I thought that was part of the APA guidelines that that's the conflict that you can't really do that you can't you can't be the expert and, and the then therapist. testify and the therapist at the same time but then of course but you can you, you can you can testify and 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 therapists do I see that all the time um, but they have to waive the the patient has to waive the privilege absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. um, but even so even if they have, um, you still run a risk um, as soon as you go in there because you've opened the file. Right. You can't selectively pull from the file um, and you might say something that uh, hurts their feelings or, or hurts the relationship in some fashion. No matter what, you've changed the nature of the relationship and it's no longer a therapeutic relationship. The other problem is if it's a setup beforehand, then uh, uh, I think it was Don who said, in essence, uh, the patient can t potentially be playing to the audience, saying what they think uh, the court and hence right. you want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's not therapy. Doesn't really help you, yeah. Where's this area of, again, drugs, alcohol, and medication vis a vis custody battle, battles going in, in Pennsylvania? I see uh, more of the medical medication issues, but it's not a, uh, it's not huge. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it comes across my desk and w we deal with it. Uh, the, the, the DUIs, the drugs, um, you're seeing more of that. I am in my practice. So you have to learn how to adapt. Yeah. You're probably seeing more of the, uh, the um, medication for the ADD or ADHD just because there's more medication being administered now for that. Right. Mm -hmm. for, for children. Sure. Right. I mean, bipolar back in the 1990s and the difference between now and Doc, you can probably bear this out. I think uh, increase in bipolar diagnoses went up something like 4,000% in a decade. Yeah, um, it became the popular diagnosis and sort of a catch-all diagnosis. But that's not really the focus now in the area. Certainly still one of the most prominent uh, diagnoses for children is ADHD. The other area which we didn't talk about tonight, um, but it's the autism spectrum disorder. And there's lots of controversy regarding uh, medication as well as inoculations revolving around autism. Um, and again, disputes that uh, in part re result from misinformation and uh, uh, misunderstanding um, that might be misused between uh, parents. We are here every Monday night dispensing legal advice. Tonight it was family law dealing with uh, drugs and alcohol and medication issues, especially when it comes to custody. If you need more information, once we leave the air, go to our website, lawjournaltv.com. You can tweet us, you can visit us on Facebook, you can write to us at info at lawjournaltv. Dot com. You can call us toll free during the week, 888-78-LAW-TV. Go to our website and one of our many sites and get your law on demand. I want to thank Bonnie Frost from Einhorn Harris in New Jersey for joining us tonight. Dr. Ronald Esteve, a clinical and counseling psychologist from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Don Spry with King Spry, Herman Freund and Fall in Eastern PA. For all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. Einhorn Harris, a long-standing community law firm with the largest family law practice in New Jersey. And The Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.